Hi, this is John Wellman, Associate Pastor at Calvary Baptist Church. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video message from Calvary today. If videos like this are a blessing to you, would you consider giving financially back to Calvary so that we can continue to make videos like this available, getting the gospel to the ends of the earth by any means necessary? Simply go to calvaryelco.org, click on the giving tab, and any donation of any size would be very much appreciated. Thank you and God bless. Father, would you speak to us now from your word? There's so much truth that we need to discover in our life. Uh, we live in a world where it seems like every single moment, every single day, we're bombarded by that which is false. We need that which is true. And we find that in the pages of your word that you've given to us. So speak truth into our lives today. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know if you're like me, but I enjoy sleeping. Okay? And uh, to make sure that, that, you know, that we get good sleep at our house, we have one of those sleep number beds, one of those select comfort beds, you know, where Jan has her setting and I have my setting. And if you want it really firm, you pump it up. And if you want it kind of soft, you lower it down. Uh, any of you others have a, a bed like that that you can adjust the comfort? Sure. Uh, it's really kind of neat to have a select comfort bed. We also have automobiles now that have select comfort climate control. You know, you got dual controls and your passenger can be just toasty warm and you can be just as cool as... I don't know how they do that when you're just two feet apart, but they have select comfort in cars now. Select comfort is a good thing, except when it comes to prayer. And unfortunately, I think that most of us pray select comfort prayers all the time. I pray for you, and you pray for me, and what we're praying about is that we might be delivered from the hardships of life. That, oh God, Help them not to go through this difficulty. Deliver them from this illness. Take care of their needs in this way. And we're, we're praying select comfort prayers. Uh, most of our prayers are select comfort prayers, if you really want to be honest. <clears throat> in fact, most Christians pray select comfort prayers. You, you come to a passage like uh, uh, second, or excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we read that and we say, okay, you know, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for another person. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. He says, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. And, and we read that and we have this idea that this verse is dealing with this kind of prayer. These uh, select comfort prayers that I'm praying for your health. I'm praying for blessings on your family. I'm praying for your financial needs. Uh, I'm praying for enjoyment in life. I mean... And oftentimes we just kind of lump it into this word blessings. God bless them. What, what does that really mean if you think about it? The reality is though that this passage from 1 Timothy is dealing with something even more fundamental than just select comfort. See, Paul is urging Timothy, who by the way was the shepherd or the pastor of the church at Ephesus, he's urging Timothy to get back to the task and to pray for the task of getting the, the good news of Jesus Christ into the world. He, he, the task of praying for the mission of taking the good news back into the whole world. And, and so Paul <clears throat> is urging that prayers be made on behalf of all men. Now why? Why would we pray for all men? Well, it's found at the end, end of verse 4, where it says that God desires men to be saved. 
The very first words in verse 1 are those words, first of all. In the Greek language, that's the word proton, which, which means first and foremost in time, order, importance, or place. Um, in other words, the Greek construction of this whole passage, if you were to boil it down, would say this. Of top priority is praying for all people because God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, what God's word is saying to us is that praying for the salvation of others is the most important thing that we should be doing. Praying for the salvation of others. Um, that's the most important thing we ought to be doing. Now, think about this with me, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to heaven. Most of you in here are going to heaven. And, and when we get to heaven, man, we're going to have a new body. We're going to have a wonderful existence. It's going to be an incredibly wonderful life. I mean, talk about a life of comfort. That's what heaven's going to be about. And yet the reality is that there are people all around us who are destined for hell. And they're going to spend eternity in great torment and great agony and discomfort. They don't know Christ. That's the condition that your one is in, the one that you're praying for, the one that God has laid on your heart. But you and I are concerned about our life, you know, and our, how comfortable we are. Why would we want to do that? Why would we be so concerned about this? Because we're going to heaven. And, and the problems that you and I face in this life are small beans compared with the wonder of what heaven's going to be like. But our one, you know, the neighbor that you're praying for or your family member that you're praying for, the co-worker that God has laid on your heart, uh, they're going to hell. And all we can do is to worship our God of comfort and pray for one another to be comfortable. When I was a, a freshman in Baylor, <clears throat> took biology course. And in my biology class, a couple of rows over, was this girl, and she's kind of attractive. Kind of, you know, yeah, really kind of neat, you know. I you know, kind of like to get to know her. When I was in college, I was very shy, especially when I came around girls. I, I just didn't talk to girls, but I thought, yeah, she's kind of neat. I'd like to kind of get to know her, but I never could get up the nerve to even talk to her. She didn't talk. She was kind of quiet and timid as well. I came back from... Christmas break, and that was back in the day when semesters in college didn't end until the middle of January. You know, you came back from from uh, Christmas, and you still had a couple of weeks of class, and then you had finals. Okay, so I came back, and the professor announced to us that this particular girl had gone home to California at Christmas, had climbed into a chest freezer, and gone asleep and took her life. And all I could think about was, is she somebody I want to date? Would she make a good girlfriend? I didn't care at all about what was going on in her life that caused such turmoil, such tragedy in her life. And, and I think that's where we are. We get so wrapped up in ourselves and in our comfort that we miss the big picture that there are people all around us that we meet every single day that have got such difficulty going on in their life. They're without Christ and they're headed for a Christless eternity. They're in a situation where <clears throat> they're missing out on what God has done for them. God has reserved a place for them in heaven through Jesus Christ and all they need to do is place their faith, their trust in Him and, and yet They'll never know that unless somebody tells them about the salvation that God has made available to them in Jesus Christ. I'm going to make a very important statement. You may not agree with me, but I want to prove from Scripture that this is a true statement. And that's this statement right here that simply says this. And I, and I, I understand the sovereignty of God. That God is sovereign and he does whatever he chooses, whatever he pleases. But 
Listen to this. The lost will not and cannot be saved unless somebody prays for them. Let me say that again. The lost cannot and indeed will not be saved unless someone prays for them. Now how can I say that? Let's look at scripture. Let me, let me point that out to you in scripture. The very first thing that we want to look at is why should I pray for my one? Why is prayer absolutely necessary for them to find faith in Jesus Christ? And I think we'll find that in scripture. First of all, <clears throat> why I should pray for my one is because I understand the spiritual condition of the lost. I understand the spiritual condition of the lost. Um, and it, it necessitates prayer. And we'll, we'll get into this in more detail here. But look at Ephesians chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. Paul is describing what it means to be lost. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the compassionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Now look at what Paul is saying. Here is the condition of a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Here's their spiritual condition. He starts by saying that they are dead. They're spiritually dead. They're, they're without life. Uh, they're purposeless. There's, there's purposelessness in there. There's meaninglessness. Uh, they have no relationship with God. They have no future. They have no hope at all. The word dead there, I don't know a word that could describe helplessness more than that word. It dead. But then he says, not only that, but you are living in sin like the rest of the world. That, that thing that, that, that separates you from God, you're living in it. You're wallowing in it. That's the picture there. He goes on and he says that you are uh, like the rest of the world. That is, you're caught up in this 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 postmodern world of relativism and tolerance and, and uh, plurality. The, the world becomes your arena of life. And it robs you of the vitality of, of what God wants to give you. And then it says that a lost person, your spiritual, your one that you're praying for, they're giving obedience to the devil. They're obeying Satan. We're going to see more about that. And then he goes on and he says they're following uh, their own sinful nature, doing their own thing, going their own way. And then finally he says they're under the wrath of God. They're subject to God's anger. Um, what does scripture say? That a person who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ is condemned already. Um, <laughs> with deference to Bruce back here. I used to be an Aaron Rodgers fan. Great quarterback. I was so disappointed by what Aaron Rodgers said just recently. That this man exhibited some just common ignorance, okay? I don't know other way to say it. When he used the typical cop-out when he was asked questions about his religious upbringing and he said this trite statement that, well, I don't believe in a God who would condemn the world to, to damnation, a God who would, who is so mean, such a mean ogre that he would condemn his beautiful world to death. Why didn't the man think original for himself, okay? Because that's not an original statement. Everybody says that, okay? I don't believe in a God who would condemn people to death. The Bible doesn't say that God condemns people to death. It's their unbelief that condemns them to death. God desires all people to be saved. And he has provided a way for their salvation. And if people go to hell, it's because they choose to do so. And so, my prayer is for Aaron Rodgers that instead of just 
repeating some stupid statement that you hear all the time about, oh, God's going to condemn. Why would I believe in a God like that? Think for yourself, man. Now, enough on that. I didn't mean to go off on that tangent. Um, Super Bowl Sunday, why not? Okay. <laughs> but why should I pray for my one? Because I understand his spiritual condition. Her spiritual condition. But second, because I understand the mastery of of Satan over there, over them as a lost person. That Satan has mastered them. <clears throat> Think about all that the Bible says about the relationship of a non-believer to Satan. First of all, Ephesians 2, again, right here in this passage, and verse 2, it says, you used to live, and it says, you're obeying the devil who is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. That, um, that phrase, spirits at work, that means the energy source. Uh, it means that Satan is the energizer of the law, of the life of the lost person. So the lost are energized by Satan. He's their source of energy for living. And then in John uh, 8, 44, it says, For you are the children of your father, the devil. So the lost are children of Satan. Uh, Jesus says, they do, the lost do things like their father does, like father, like son, you know. He says, all their deeds are wicked. He goes on, look at Acts 26, verse 18. Uh, Paul is praying that, uh, you know, he was sent to open the, their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. In the New uh, American Translation, the word there, power, is the word dominion. It's the word exousia which uh, means authority, which means the dominion. So the lost are under Satan's authority. He is their authority. He's their Lord. He's their master. And <clears throat> then when you go to Isaiah chapter 14, here's a passage that's talking about Satan and his, and his origin. And, and it says this in Isaiah 14 verse 12. It, speaking of to Satan, he says, You, the bright morning star, have fallen from the sky. You brought down other nations. Now you are brought down. You said to yourself, I'll climb to heaven and place my throne above the highest stars. I'll sit there with the gods far away in the north. I'll be above the clouds just like God himself. Those who see you will stare and wonder, is this the man who made the world tremble and shook up, his, uh, and shook up kingdoms? Did he capture every city and make earth a desert? Is he the one who refused to let prisoners go home. See, the lost are prisoners of Satan. So, so why do we need to pray? It says because Satan refuses to let the prisoners go free. We have this idea that a lost person can just, oh, they can decide for themselves, I'm going to be a Christian, I'm not going to be a Christian, I'm going to follow Christ, I don't want to Folks, the door of the prison isn't open. It's locked. Satan refuses to let prisoners go. And when a, a lost person is saved, it's, it's because Satan has reluctantly let that person go because of the power of God that is at work in that situation. It, it's when God's power intervenes. The only way a person can be saved is through the power of God. How do we get the power of God into a situation? Through prayer. Through prayer. Look at, at 2 Corinthians 4, uh, beginning at verse 3. <clears throat> Paul says, If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. So a lost person has their minds blinded. By Satan. He says they are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So the, blind, the, the lost are blinded to the good news by Satan. So Satan has blinded them. They can't see the truth because of Satan's blinding in, in, their, in their face. And then in Mark chapter 3 and verse 27. Jesus says this, no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man 
and then he will plunder his house. So the lost are the property of Satan. And you know what? Satan doesn't want us messing with his property. That's why you and I've got to bring God into the situation through prayer. Now, the only way we can do that is through the power of Jesus Christ and the blood of the Lamb that was slain. And, and, and you know, to, to bind Satan so that that person can see the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because only when we have bound Satan through the power of Jesus Christ can that person, can we plunder Satan's house and, and rescue that person from, from destructions. And, and from destruction. And folks, that is only accomplished through intense, passionate prayer. If we're not praying for the lost, they're not going to be saved because they're captive by Satan. Why should I pray for my one? Well, a third reason is because I understand this is spiritual warfare. We're, we're engaged in spiritual warfare. Ephesians six twelve. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the, in the heavenly places. So witnessing and winning someone to Jesus Christ... It's, it's not a matter of my will against his will. It's, it's not, I got to logically convince them that, that Christianity is true or, or in some ways I've got to persuade them or I got to strong arm them into accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. No, this is spiritual warfare with all the demonic forces of hell that, that uh, have got such a hold on that person that unless God intervenes, they will never escape the clutches of Satan. This is warfare. And it's got to be fought in a different way than any other war that you and I have ever, ever heard about or ever engaged in. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So, spiritual warfare for the souls, the hearts of men and women is fought not with human weapons, but with supernatural weapons. And you know what? We only have two supernatural weapons. Ephesians 6 says it's the word of God and the word of prayer. And unless we're engaged in praying and speaking the word of God to them, we're not going to wrestle them away from the clutches of Satan. It's not going to happen. Because, friends, the only thing that makes Satan tremble is prayer. And when we pray, what are we doing? We are inviting God into the fray, onto the battlefield. That's where the victory is won. Therefore, the only way that a person can find salvation in Jesus Christ is because somebody is praying and bringing God into the battle. Now, that's why we should pray. How then should we pray? Look at this second point there in your outline. And I think there are five factors <clears throat> that are really critically important about how do we pray for a lost person. The first one of these is, is just brokenness brokenness. Uh, the psalmist said this in Psalm 126 beginning at verse 5, those who sow in tears shall reap with joy, shout, joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Now this is not the fact that when you go out to sow your corn, that you ought to be crying over your corn. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about reaping the souls of men, people and, and ladies who need to know Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. This is the law of spiritual harvest. Unfortunately, we want the harvest without the heartbreak. We've got to be brokenhearted for the lost. Leonard Ravenhill said this, God does not answer many prayers. They are too locked up in self-pity or aimed at, at personal benefit. He does answer desperate prayers. And, and so until we get desperate for 
the souls of our, of our lost friends and, and neighbors. Our prayers for them are going to go unanswered. You've got to get broken hearted for their lostness. <clears throat> I mean, think about Jesus. It says Jesus prayed and, and cried, wept over Jerusalem. Well, just like he wept over Jerusalem, we need to weep over our lost ones. We need to weep over our lost community. Um, if we really want to see salvation happen here, we've got to be, we've got to be broken hearted. Because that which breaks God's heart ought to break our heart. William Booth, who was the, uh, the founder of uh, the Salvation Army, General William Booth, uh, one time received a letter from some of his workers out in the field, and they were lamenting the fact that very few people were responding to the gospel message. And he wrote them back a two-word letter. And the letter simply said, Try tears. Do you want your lost family members saved? Do you want your coworkers saved? Do you want your neighbors saved? Try tears. We've got to be broken hearted over the lost condition. Second thing is persistence. And that's also needed. You've got to be persistent in it. You remember, Satan refuses to release his prisoners. He's not going to let them go easily. So persistent prayer is necessary because Satan is so reluctant to give them up. It's not because God is unwilling to save them. It's because Satan is reluctant to let go of them. Um, you know, Satan, Satan is able to, to control countries and cultures and all those kinds of things. Talk to our missionaries about how sometimes the laboring is so long and intense and it doesn't seem like they're making any progress. We call William Carey the father of modern day missionary movement. Do you realize that he went seven years in India before he saw the first person come to faith in Jesus Christ? You and I probably would have given up after a year, right? Uh, this isn't it. it. must not be God's will for me to be here because it's not happening. Let me move on somewhere. Adoniram Justin, Adoniram Justin, uh, get it right here, Adoniram Judson, seven years in, in Burma before he saw the first convert to Jesus Christ. See, one of Satan's favorite tactics uh, is to make a situation seem so impossible that we're going to get discouraged and we're going to quit praying. Um, but if we could see what's happening when we're praying, if we could open our eyes to the spiritual plane, there's great victory happening on that spiritual plane. God is at work and he's battling on our behalf for our lost friends. So don't give up. Uh, the testimony of George Mueller, and I've talked about George Mueller a lot. What a m great man of prayer. He was the kind of man that, that could pray for things and they would happen just immediately. Within the day, he would get his answers to prayer. Uh, things like an orphanage didn't have any food to put on the table. And they would sit down and, and George Mueller would lead them in the blessing. And there would be a knock on the door and there would be a broke down dairy truck outside saying, hey, we, we, we got to get rid of this. Can you use it? That was the kind of man that George Mueller was. He could pray and God would answer it. But that wasn't always the case. Mueller gives this testimony. He says, sometimes I have had to wait weeks, months, or years. Sometimes many years. <laughs> and he, he wrote and he said this, in November of 1844, I began praying for the conversion of five individuals. I prayed every day without one single intermission. Eighteen months elapsed before the first of the five was converted. I thanked God and I prayed for the others. Five years elapsed and then the second one was converted. I thank God for the second and I prayed on for the other three. Day by day I continued to pray for them and six years more passed before the third was converted. I thank God for these three and I went praying on uh, for the other two. These two remain unconverted. And, and so he goes on and he talks about the fact that he prayed for 36 years for the conversion of, of these two people. And, and he concluded his account with these words. He says, the great point 
is never give up until the answer comes. I have been praying for 63 years and 8 months for one man's conversion. He is not saved yet, but he will be. How can it be otherwise? I am praying. That day came when Mueller's friend finally accepted Christ, but it wasn't until Mueller's casket was lowered in the grave. And that man in the quiet corner of that cemetery opened his heart and gave his life to Jesus Christ. One biographer summarized Mueller's success in prayer with these four words, he did not quit. We're going to see our friends, law, our friends saved. Persistence is absolutely necessary. But another thing is pleadings. I mean, you turn to Scripture and you look in the Bible and, and you see those who had power with God oftentimes were pleading with God. Uh, Abraham pleading over Sodom. Moses pleading for the children of Israel after they had sinned. Uh, King Hezekiah pleading for the people of, of, of Israel or, or for Judah. And the list goes on and on. Um, Charles Spurgeon says this, and I, I laugh because yesterday at the... Uh, men's conference, uh, they were talking about that everybody quotes Spurgeon. Well, here's my Spurgeon quote, okay? Spurgeon says, it's the habit of faith when she is praying to use please. Mere prayer sayers who do not pray at all forget to argue with God. But those who would prevail bring forth their reason and their strong arguments, and they debate the question with God. O oh, brethren, let us learn to, thus to plead the precepts, the promises, and whatever else may serve our turn. Let a, uh, but let us always have something to plead. Do not reckon you have prayed unless you have pleaded, for pleading is the very marrow of prayer. You know, there are hundreds of verses in Scripture that you and I can use to plead with God for the lost people. Um, you, can, you can plead with the promises of God concerning salvation. Uh, you can plead uh, the attributes and, the, and the, uh, the attitude of God toward men. God, you're a God of mercy. Show mercy on this. God, you've said in Scripture, you're a God of grace. Extend grace to them. Plead with God. Use his love and all the promises to plead with God. Say, God, you said this, therefore do this. So plead with God. Still another crucial factor it needs to be our motive. We've got to have pure motives. <clears throat> Think about it. Why do you want that person to be saved? What's your motive behind it? Wife, are you praying for your husband to be saved? And is the reason you're doing that is so that there'll be less strife at home? Are you praying for him to be saved so that you won't argue as much? Is that a select comfort prayer? What is the motive behind your praying? Many times our prayers for salvation of others is really based on self-centered motives, if you think about it. There can be only one motive when we pray for the salvation of others, and that's the glory of God. Listen to what Jesus said. <coughs> John 15, verse 8. <coughs> When you produce much fruit, and obviously that's the salvation of others. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This will bring great glory to God my Father. See, the Bible is really clear on this point about what are your motives in your prayer life. James says this, even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. That's kind of a select comfort prayer there. See, if you've been praying a long time for somebody, especially a family member, and it doesn't seem to be the answer is coming, you're not seeing the results there, you might want to check your motives. Why is it that I want them saved? Are you doing it for God's glory or for some other reason? Then another part of how we should pray should be that of, of, our, of a spiritual sacrifice. Um, one of the most remarkable statements is found in, it's kind of a continuation of Romans chapter 10 and then back to Romans chapter 9. Uh, Paul's example, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, he says, um, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So he's praying for the salvation of the Jewish people. 
That was the desire of his heart. Well, how intense was that desire? We'll go back to chapter 9 and you see the intensity of the desire that Paul had for the Jewish people to be saved. In, in chapter 9, verse 2 and 3, says, My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. And listen to this. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Do you see the intensity of what Paul is saying there? He's telling his lost Jewish brothers and sisters, I will go to hell for you. I'll go to hell if it means that you go to heaven. Now, um, we know that God's not going to allow us to take another person's place in hell. That, that, that's not going to happen, of course. But don't you think that would be a pretty effective prayer to, to, to pray for somebody to say, you know what, I would rather be cut off from God so that you might be saved. That's kind of an intense kind of a, a, a thing. That's a spiritual sacrifice that Paul is exhibiting here. These are just five different factors, okay? Uh, and there are others. But let me close with one final question here. How then should we pray for the lost? What, what, what is it we need to say? What are the words we need to use? How, how do you, what are the specific requests that I need to make when I'm praying for a lost person? Let me just mention some, and, and you've seen these. We've used them in our prayer room when we've had 24 hours of prayer and 40 hours of prayer and all that. But these are things that you pray for a lost person. Number one, pray that God would sanctify them. That God would sanctify my one. I mean, that's how God begins his work in a person's life. He sanctifies them, or the word means to set apart. Um, uh, he sets that, part, that person apart before saving them. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. He's talking about that God has chosen us according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and, and that means the election, the choosing of God on our life. He does that through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. For the obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. And then again in, in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for you brothers loved by the Lord. Because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Through belief in the truth. And through belief in the truth. See it's, it's like God is drawing an invisible circle around a person's life. And then he begins to let his influence bombard that circle using circumstances, using people to influence that person, to draw them to himself. And, and boy, when God is at work inside that circle, watch out because things are going to be happening in that person's life. So start by saying, God, circle their life. Begin bombarding them with things that will point them to you, to, to Jesus Christ. And then second... Pray that God would bless your one. That, that you're asking God's best on that person. Uh, Paul writing in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance. You see, God's kindness in a person's life is there to help them to look up and see that God is the source of these blessings. So God bless them and help them to recognize that those blessings in their life come from you and that they're designed to point them back to you. A, a third thing that you ought to be praying is that God would convict them, that God would convict my one. Um, because folks, conviction is necessary for salvation. They, they need to know that they're wrong before God. They, they need to see that and they, they need to admit their disobedience. And the fact of the matter is that only the Holy Spirit can convict a person. You can't shame a person into wanting to receive Christ. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to convict them. To show them that they're wrong. Uh, John chapter 16 verse 8 says, When he, and it's talking about the Holy Spirit, comes, <clears throat> he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin. They're wrong. In regard to righteousness, this is the way in which they need to be living. And judgment, the judgment to come. So they need the Holy Spirit to convict them. They need the Holy Spirit to convict them of the sin of unbelief. It goes on in verse 9 to say, The world's sin is 
that it refuses to believe in me. You see, people already know they commit sins. They already know that they blow it, that they lie, they cheat. Uh, they already know they've got sin in their life. They know that that has separated them from God. But the key thing is the sin that condemns them to hell is the sin of unbelief. I mean, if, if sins kept us from heaven, we'd be in trouble because all of us sin. But through Jesus Christ, those sins have been forgiven. But it's the sin of unbelief that condemns a person to hell. And so they need for God through his Holy Spirit to convict them of their disobedience, of their unbelief that they need Jesus Christ in their life. Now again, let me remind you, conviction of sin doesn't automatically lead to salvation because they may know their need. They may be convicted of the wrong in their life. But they've still got to turn to Jesus Christ. They've still got to invite him into their heart, into their life. Uh, they may know their need, but they might not choose to do anything with it. And then a fourth thing, we need to pray that God would illuminate them. Shine light into their head, into their eyes, that they would, they would see the truth. Because even after a person comes under conviction of their need for salvation, their eyes could be blinded to the truth of, of the gospel. They, their eyes could remain closed to, to God's truth. Paul writing again in 2 Corinthians 4, 1. We, we saw this a little bit earlier, but let me read it again. Satan has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. <clears throat> They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So we need to pray that God would open their hearts, open their minds to the truth of the gospel. You know, when somebody is closed and blinded by Satan. You can preach to them all day long and it doesn't make sense to them. It falls on deaf ears. I have no clue what you're talking about. But when the Holy Spirit comes and opens their heart, opens their mind, suddenly, oh, I see it now. And they can accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, he go, Paul goes on in verse 6 there, 2 Corinthians 4. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. So we need to ask God to open their minds, open their hearts of, of your one so that they can see the gospel for what, it, what it's all about. In other words, we need to pray, God... Help them to have an unhindered look at the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Satan has blinded them from seeing the truth. We need to have an unprejudiced look at the gospel. And when they see Jesus Christ for who he really is, and there's not Satan's interference, then they're going to be open to accepting him as Lord and Savior. They can be saved. And then finally, we need to pray that God would save that one. What did Jesus say in Luke 19, <clears throat> verse 10? For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost. Um, the thought here is, is not that Jesus is going to make an attempt to locate lost people, that they're out there somewhere and he's looking for them. Because lost people are all around us. The term seek here really carries with them the idea of orchestrating circumstances that point them to Jesus Christ. And, and so when we pray that God will save them, folks, we must be willing for God to do whatever is necessary in their life to bring them to salvation. And so parents, you're praying for a lost child, lost son or daughter or son-in-law or daughter-in-law. You've got to be willing to allow them to go through hell because that may be just what God is using to draw them to Jesus Christ. Don't shield them from the troubles they're going through. Because God is using those troubles to help them to, to see their need for Jesus Christ. Those dilemmas of the human condition. They're just events that God is orchestrating in their life. That's designed to bring them to repentance. So let me challenge you during these next days. For your one that you've, God has laid on your heart. Begin pleading with God.
for them, for their salvation. Use all of these things that we've talked about, that God would sanctify them, that God would bless them, that God would, would convict them, that God would open their minds and their eyes to see the truth, that take the blinders off, that, that God would save them. That's how we need to pray for the lost. Because folks, this is spiritual warfare. Only tool that you and I have besides the word of God on the plane of spiritual warfare is prayer. And we need to use it to the fullest to reach people for Jesus Christ. Because a lost person cannot and will not find salvation in Jesus Christ unless you and I are praying for them.